Hey there everyone, Misha from Cypress Pillar Healing Arts. I am here to introduce you to a really spectacular native Florida plant, Spanish moss. In this video, we will talk about the beautiful qualities of this plant, where to find it, how to identify it, and some of the ways that it's been used by humans and animals th over the years. If you like this plant profile, please consider liking and hitting that subscribe button to join us for many more great videos here at Cypress Pillar Healing Arts. We'll be doing lots more plant profiles to help both herbalists and nature lovers alike learn more about native wild Florida. So join me. So here we have our Spanish moss, which is neither Spanish nor a moss. It's in the Romeliad family, actually. So if you can think of plants like a pineapple, it's more closely related to that. Now Spanish moss is considered an apophyte, and one of the myths that we have here in Florida is that it somehow kills the tree. And if you look at this, this, okay, this looks bad. I know, this doesn't look so great. But it turns out that the Spanish moss is here not because it's harming the tree, but because it's actually a great growing condition for it. So it really likes shade. It totally can grow in full sun as well, or mixed shady sun. But this is a great place for it because it's nice and close to the water, loves that moisture, loves the humidity, and it's under shade. So we get a uh, just a, an overwhelming amount of Spanish moss in this site. As an epiphyte, that means that it's not parasitic to the tree or anything it's growing on. It doesn't harm them. It actually has tiny little scales along the parts of the moss that you see here that give it that gray green color and they're completely adapted to help take in things like water what that comes from rain different types of mist or fog and any kind of condensation that comes in to help the tree or to help the the moss be able to live without being rooted into the ground now you all have probably seen me touching the spanish moss and that's another myth that we hear about spanish moss a lot that it's all completely filled with bugs. And that's kind of true. I have never had any problems with Spanish moss that is up about three feet or higher off the ground. It's the stuff that's on the ground that you wanna be careful with. And one of the things you always hear is that Spanish moss has chickens in it or it has red bugs. And that is totally true. I can tell you from firsthand experience, I sat in a patch of Spanish moss, didn't even think about it, totally came home with triggers the next day and it was not a fun thing so i don't recommend it i have done it for you so you do not have to but the moss that's up in the tree and again it's it's really not a moss it's an epiphyte but what's up in the tree is generally okay to touch one thing to keep in mind is that it is home to a variety of different animals we have at least three different bats in the state of florida that make their home in the in the moss we also have all different types of little birds like warblers that really enjoy living in it and we all have bigger birds like even our our uh, national symbol the bald eagle will take the moss and put it in their nest so that they can build their nest so it's really really great for environment and habitat and oh for you spider fans out there, we actually have one type of jumping spider that only lives in Spanish moss. So perhaps I should take like a little step away because I don't want to interrupt the jumping spiders. But let's take a look at our beautiful Talenzia and, and see how it is made and how it moves and how it is spread throughout the habitat. So it does get these really beautiful little flowers on it. They're bright green. Unfortunately, we don't have any flower right now but it's able to spread from, um, it'll actually put little fibers off that can break and be spread as birds carry it. And it also will get to seed. So I have a seed right here and I'll show it to you. It's really neat because it looks a bit like dandelion. You can kind of see it has the little fluffs. And you can imagine the wind really taking this and just carrying it away works really, really well. So all of the Spanish moss you see in these trees is capable of reproducing by seed or in some cases by breaking off and being able to uh, spread in that way. And again, it's not harmful to the trees, but if it's in an area like this where it's got optimal growing conditions, you will see quite a bunch of it. And really the only way it can kind of hurt the tree is if sometimes you get so much of it, it can become so heavy that it could cause a tree branch to break, but that's a pretty rare condition. Now let's talk a little bit about some of the uses, both medicinal and historically and traditional of Spanish moss. 
All right, so we have found something super neat when we were out looking for places to film this beautiful Spanish moss. And I don't know if you all can see, but this is actually a nest. Now, before anybody gets really upset about me being this close to a nest, it is abandoned. We did check it out with binoculars, kind of passed by it and um, didn't realize at first that it was a nest because it is camouflaged so well. And then we backed up and checked it out to make sure nobody was home and it is abandoned. But this is a really great example. There is actually a cup nest inside of the moss and it's completely covered with the moss. And this moss is both still living. So you can see the gray green color as well as some that has um, died back with the black moss and a really great example of how animals can use this to both live in the moss and to build their nests as well. Here you can see a nice close-up video of that beautiful little bird's nest and the fibers of the moss have actually been woven together and pulled together to create a cavity that is just perfect and nice and sturdy to hold any eggs that might be laid within the cup. So another great example of how this incredible plant helps not only humans but animals too. So we talked a little bit about how Spanish moss got its Latin name, Talanzia unias, <laughs> usnia oids. Watch me murder as, as I, uh, just totally destroy that Latin name. But how did it get that common name, Spanish moss? Well, it actually has a lot of different names. Sometimes you'll hear it called old man's beard, which is also a common name for its namesake, Usnia, which is a type of lichen. You may also hear it called hanging moss. There's a lot of different names for it. And it's important to understand that even before we kind of gave it our own names, the indigenous people that lived in North, Central and South America had names of their own for it. And that just kind of gives you an idea of how recognized this plant was and how often it was used by humans. Legend has it that it got its name Spanish moss because originally it was called Spanish beard. And that was kind of a like a little uh, snippy little slight to the Spaniard explorers by their competitive French brethren. So the French referred to this beautiful plant as Spanish beards because it looked all scraggly and gray. The Spanish, not to be outdone, referred to it as French hair to kind of combat that because they didn't want it to be named after them. But it turned out that the Spanish idea stuck. Now again, it's not from Spanish, it's com or Spain. It's completely native here in our southeastern United States, all the way into Central America, it's parts of South America and the Caribbean. So it's a beautiful native plant, but that's just a good example of how a common name can kind of be um, sort of made up and, and stuck. And there's some different legends about different Spanish explorers that came through and kind of being named after them as well. And, and not all of them are, are, are uh, super politically correct. So we won't go into those. Another thing about the history of this plant, we talked a little bit about the red bugs or the chiggers that people are often say are found in the moss. And again, my experience has been when it's about three feet or higher, like the moss right here that's growing on this grapevine, you're usually okay. But the moss that's scattered around on the ground, that's the ones that you wanna be careful of. And historically, this moss has been used for many different things by humans, including, believe it or not, things like stuffing furniture, even the pillows and the beds of some of the old cars. And it's said that in the 1900s, hundreds of thousands of pounds of this moss were harvested. Now that's totally okay if it was up in the trees, but not so great if it was picked up off the ground. And legend has it that the um, that some of the earlier Ford cars had to completely be recalled because when they were put out after being assembled, the seats had been stuffed with Spanish moss that came from the ground as opposed to in the trees, and they were infested with chiggers. So it's kind of a fun little history fact that's that's or, or um, I guess I shouldn't say fact, but a fun little little history nod that. Uh, that we hear. Whether or not that actually happened, we do know that this plant was in fact used to stuff furniture, uh, including mattresses as well. So if you can imagine laying back on a nice bed of Spanish moss, it may seem kind of crazy, but this moss is actually really soft. It's really pliable. It holds its shape well. It wouldn't um, kind of disintegrate very easily because the moss itself is pretty strong. And that fiber that we talked about, um, the little scales that are on the outside that are giving it this gray green color, that actually helps it absorb moisture as well. The Spanish moss can absorb up to 10 times 
its um, volume, weight, and moisture, which is pretty cool. So if you put it in a, in a mattress, it was known to keep things nice and cool. It was also used by early pioneers as insulation in houses. That's right, they would take the moss, mix it with clay, and pack it into their homes. And some of those homes are still standing today, so it's a pretty tough plant. So when we talk about the medicinal uses of this plant, honestly, it, it does have them for sure. And I think probably the people who knew them best are and were the indigenous people. In our modern Western Materia Medica, we don't hear about it used a lot. There's definitely other plants that we would probably choose first before going to this one. And I think that it's probably best known for some of those historical uh, reasons that I had mentioned. I think it was used for stuffing furniture all the way up into the 1960s. There was even a, a factory in Gainesville that turned out lots of products stuffed with it. It was also used, um, as we said, for insulation and homes. And today it's even still used for crafts and especially in the floral industry. It's a big favorite for that. Medicinally, it is known as a feverfuge. So it's known as a plant that can bring the fever down. And it's also supposedly very good to help with rheumatism. This plant can also be used to pack wounds. Again, you'd want to be really careful with it because you didn't, you wouldn't want to pick it up off the ground, but because it is astringent and some would argue antibacterial as well, it is something that some of our earlier settlers would use to pack an open wound just to kind of absorb the blood and help with the clotting process. Spanish moss is edible, although I will tell you, you have to go through a lot of effort in order to get this to even be at a place where you could eat it. Right now, it's not really the best season for it, but you'll see these little tiny green pieces come off of the moss. That is the edible tips. And it's a little bit under debate as well about whether or not um, that's actually edible or whether it's just, you know, a tiny little bit of green that tastes kind of nice in order to actually be able to get a great deal of uh, biomaterial from this to sustain you you'd have to work pretty hard but again that doesn't mean the plant has value or doesn't have value rather in a survival situation if we are able to dry out our spanish moss or find dried moss or even not dry you can strip off the um, the outer covering and inside you'll find a fiber and you can actually use that as really great kindling. So you can strip it off. You can kind of see I pulled a piece out. So you can strip that off of there and use that as kindling as well. So this is a beautiful plant with many uses for us, not even, not even necessarily medicinally, before we even get into its medicinal value, it is amazing for us as humans for just helping us survive. And it's important to remember that, especially at a time when people were coming to Florida and you know, there were no paths, there were no roads, right? Or there were, but they were pretty rough. They were coming out into areas just like this where there were trees everywhere. We have the saw palmettos, which um, you can just see past me over here. They were super tall. We'll walk over to them just to kind of give you an idea. So if you imagine coming to the state of Florida as an early settler and having to make your way through these palmettos, these are even pretty, these guys are even pretty short and all of them do have their namesake. They have like little uh, sharp teeth on their, their fronds. So imagine having to come through these. We had a lot of different nicks and scratches and maybe not so many doctors around. So being able to use this beautiful little plant, not just for medicinal uses of which we, we did have some, we have evidence that it was boiled down into a tea, as again, for fevers and rheumatism being used to pack wounds, also different oils from it were said to help with things like sprains and different aches and pains. But it also was just great to have in the home for everything from stuffing mattresses to kindling to insulation. So really beautiful plant. And I hope you've enjoyed meeting this little native.